Um, so I'm going to do a short um, introduction also. So for those uh, audience members who haven't joined us yesterday and to sort of just think through the relationships that develop between the presentations of our day one of Experimenter Curators Hub um, 2018. Um, the house rules, just to sort of repeat, uh, are to please switch off your phones uh, or put them on silent. Please don't cross these lines um, in the middle of the room, etc., across the presentation in the middle of presentations. Um, and also, um, is there anything else? Actually, that's it. okay, that's questions all. At uh, questions at the end. Uh, presenters are going to present for around thirty minutes, and then we're going to enter into dialogue. So, in in um, Jubaish's presentation, he reminded us of Deleuze's uh, key text, Postscript on the Societies of Control, and I was thinking of this one passage which is, there is no need to ask which is the toughest or most tolerable regime, for it's within each of them that liberating and enslaving forces confront one another. When we address archival production, we are made to confront dynamic currents of history telling and historical becoming. It was through, let us say, plowing the archive of cultural practitioners from Sabi's presentation, that a plurality in thinking and materiality beyond schemes of control, hegemonic memory, and even the grasp of monolingual form emerge. Sabi and Jibesh um, were also encouraging us to think through the suspicion of big data and the politics of fake data. How are we to continue to consider the organic character of duration with room for forgetting, rearrangements, detours and as w from within the data paradigm which defines an exist an image of our collective existence citation and sourcing are indeed key to curatorial practice and further to spatializing thought so we were exposed to different positions around these acts erin considered citation as accumulated experiential knowledge Jibesh spoke of how an exhibition-making approach emerges by articulating cer certain source fields that perform as contact zones, as exploding spaces to think differently about exhibition-making exhibition and artistic work across different generations. They also think about inventing new forms each time, and this is included for the Shanghai Biennale, the theory opera, to read a sort of dissonance and incoherence within contested, though it may be, within Ritvik Ghatak's Jukti, uh, Tabo Argapo, um, and also think about um, scientific history and responses um, to um, structures and apparatus, such as Foucault's pendulum. The importance of hacking the archive and of its, on, and of its incomplete construction has also been foregrounded for us. How to reinvent through use? What does it mean for curators to use the archive of institutions that have been prior, that have been prior to their work, that have disappeared <coughs> across regimes? How do we use these institutional sources and oral testimonies uh, and memories of the artists who, ha who come from um, a certain generation um, who have been teachers, for instance? This was something that Erin was talking about, coming from um, the field of, of, of human rights study, et cetera. What does it mean for her um, to come to uh, Cambodia uh, within, in the aftermath of, uh, of the civil war as well? What does it mean um, for artists of the current generation to reject the gaze um, of a tourist archive, um, of a colonial archive? And what are the new strategies of overturning the power regime of image production in that aftermath? Jubesh also encouraged us to think about the incoherence um, of, of practice. Um, and in this case, we also think about incoherence in relation to cities within um, today's presentation um, as capacity and not only as a sort of formal provocation or as a strategy of exclusion. And he sort of mentioned rambling and stuttering as a state of encounter. 
Today we will also think about an important notion um, through the presentation of Bonaventure um, Ndikung, which is about which is hospitality, um, and hospitality as the enmeshing of hostility and hospitality, becoming strange, of embracing strangeness, and of living in a time of estrangement. To think also of sonority and inter extra disciplinarity within exhibition making, and where sound becomes a, a, um, where sound becomes epistemology, and that's something that we're going to also look at in today's presentations. Um, I just want to quote from an essay of Prasad Chetty and Rupali Kupte, who will present today at the end. Cities are formally complex, experientially intense, and have logics that are incoherent. They fold spaces, practices, and relationships together to create an enormous, perpetually transforming morph. And when you think about Kakata and sort of that, that, uh, pro that sort of beginning of their essay also uh, becomes grounded in a completely different way. So with that, I'm actually going to come to the first presentation for this morning um, and read to you um, Adam Shumjik's biography shortly. Uh, but y'all, some of y'all may also be familiar because he is participating for the second time. Um, in the meantime, uh, Documenta 14 has taken place. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of before, after, and so we're very, very glad to be having this discussion with you. Um, Adam uh, Shimjik is artistic director of Documenta 14. He was co-founder of the Foxal Gallery Foundation in Borso, um, between and worked there also as curator between 1997 till 2003, which was when he took up the post of director at Kunsthalle Basel in Switzerland. Um, there he realized um, several exhibitions, a lot of which were solo exhibitions. Um, and this is also something uh, that Adam sort of maintains as his focus on um, certain artistic um, trajectories has been ongoing for very, very long. And certain of those artists were introduced within Documenta 14, uh, but there was also uh, practices that, uh, so those include sort of artists such as Michelle O'Dea, for instance, uh, Mara Devi, uh, who are artists who he has worked with, Naeem Mohemen, uh, which was his uh, last exhibition at Kunsthalle Basel, but also uh, what it meant for us as a sort of um, huge team to work together, not as agents, <coughs> but really um, as colleagues uh, from the very start of Documenta 14, and uh, also expand the field of our, our thinking and our engagement uh, with artists in which we were introducing artists to one another, and that was a very important part of our process. Um, Adam also co-curated with Elena Filipovich, the fifth Berlin Biennale for Contemporary Art, um, and he's won, uh, he's been the recipient of the Walter Hobbs Award for Curatorial Achievement um, at the Menel Foundation, Houston, um, and we'll let Adam start with that. Thank you. <coughs> Um, I'm not an early bird, so it's going to take me a while to to get the ball rolling, I suppose. So maybe I would just, can you hear me first of all? Yeah, the microphone permit, permitting. It's on. One sec. Yeah, how about now? Yes. It's better? Okay. Yeah, my my uh, th the last exhibition um, the Kunsthalle of Basel was actually I think not not Naim's, but there was one one exhibition in uh, 2014 in the fall, which was which was a kind of closing moment, and that was um, the Argentinian artist David Lamelas, um, which was a very very special moment because the exhibition was was basically a, a reenactment of David Lamela's piece called Timeless Activity, where people were arranged in a sort of diagonal in a, across a vast um, gallery on the upper floor of, of, of the Kunsthalle would, would basically pass the time to each other by basically t telling t one person to the other st standing in this diagonal across the room the time of the moment, and this time would, of course, pass. So at a certain point, there would be a, a, a one minute later. So there's a kind of moment of very um, fragile transmission between random uh, members 
um, of the audience who participate in the work and who step in and step, <coughs> step out um, of this line of people uh, passing the time to each other. So the time is, is being sustained um, by a presence of what nominally and normally should pass uh, for, should be considered an audience. An audience is a, is, in most cases it's a, it's, it's a passive um, anonymous body in which individuals have basically no role to play. And this is something that, that is particularly striking in mega exhibitions um, as, as they would call, or as some would call, um, the documenta. Uh, in mega exhibitions, uh, the main issue with the audience is to reach a certain number of visitors, and you know very soon the press is beginning to, uh, I mean the media and you know people around politicians and so forth, they begin to speculate whether the number of visitors of the previous edition is going to be exceeded because, um, very much like in these diagrams shown yester yesterday, you know there is a constant. Uh, growth um, among, you know, th throughout the 13 editions of Documenta from the first edition in 1955, which was visited by a pretty fair number of 100,000 uh, people, up to um, the Documenta 13, wh which had, I believe, around, uh, I don't know, 800,000 or so. So there was always this push for a million. We are going for a million visitors, you know, and this was something that I, and you know, the, our entire team tried to a little bit, um, 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 if not reject them, to just pare down this this uh, expectation of kind of exhibition producing uh, masses of visitors. You know, this this kind of production of audience through an exhibition and the audience considered as numbers is something that that is very detrimental to 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 any attempt of at singular individual understanding of what an exhibition or parts of exhibition could be and mean. With documenta or with exhibition of the magnitude of documenta it's becoming even more difficult and especially with documenta 14 because as, as you probably all know um, documenta 14 was two exhibitions or we would call it two acts of one exhibition. One took place in Athens and opened in um, April uh, 2017 and the, 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 s the second one which should have been normally the Documenta proper in Kassel opened in Kassel as a second act in um, June 2017 with a period of uh, around six weeks overlap and I'm just repeating this a little bit because I think when I, when I spoke here in Kolkata for the first time all of that was j just an assumption, you know. So in the very beginning there were very lofty ideas and assumptions about what, what this exhibition could possibly be. And I'm afraid that um, the, the result actually not only um, was able to stand to, but also kind of surpassed these expectations. And not, I'm not talking about the size of exhibition. For me it's still an exhibition that had uh, moments of uh, actually plenty of areas or, or, or kind of focal points or focal areas while it was definitely vast by which I do not mean that it was uh, kind of oversized you know so sometimes um, um, the area um, that is covered by a cultural undertaking and there I don't only mean the space meaning Athens castle and all exhibition venues over 13 Athens and similar number in Kassel, but also one has to add to it um, other fields that were, uh, so to say, affected um, or engaged um, um, with um, in, in the exhibition. And this is, for instance, television. So regular programming on the Greek national channel called ERT. And this is the channel that uh, some years before Documenta opened in Athens was, was closed due to economic reasons, so the national television did not exist for a period of time. Um, the uh, TV viewers would, would turn on uh, the, the TV and they would see a black screen. 
uh, which must have been a, a shocking experience if you expect the news, for instance. So uh, during the time when we were working on Documenta, this television was again already operating, and we decided to approach the ERT and propose around 50 evenings, one Mondays actually, where we would uh, program, I think, around two hours uh, usually, and this uh, would be uh, on air, on television, um, <laughs> and seen not only in Athens, but also in many other places in Greece, everywhere where the television reaches. So one could say that the programming of Documenta in this way also reached the very tiny villages in Greece. And if you were, if you had a sleepless night, because it was quite late, like at 11 o'clock, I think, um, in the evening you would be able to see a film by, uh, say, Jonas Mekas <coughs> on uh, state television, which, which is quite untypical. And I think it's a very good way for, for uh, let's say, an audience or, or recipients to, to experience something of an exhibition without bothering with getting on a car or bus or train and going to Athens or, or traveling to Kassel, which is even more expensive and more complicated. Uh, then there were radio stations as part of the project called Every, um, Every Time I Hear the, the Sound, um, uh, which was organized by Bonaventure, who's going to be uh, late, later, I think, speaking um, today via Skype or, or so. Um, so, um, this was a radio which uh, extended to several different countries around the world uh, where we worked with existing uh, radio stations, so it was not created from the scratch each time, but um, there were uh, particular um, stations identified um, in advance and asked to either host parts of our programming or to, to prepare special programs of kind of sonic nature um, by necessity, of course, it was the radio. And this together, plus the radio specially created in Berlin called SEVI Radio, with um, a number of projects commissioned specially from the sound artists added to kind of not only the spatial outreach, but also to, to the kind of temporal um, dimension of the exhibition. So the exhibition was kind of dispersed. It was everywhere and was at different times, different locations. So. I'm, I'm talking about it in order to say that the exhibition is not only that which is kind of contained within within a gallery or museum or a kind of post-industrial space that is re, uh, repurposed to become a temporary exhibition venue and all these kind of maneuvers that we know um, <coughs> all, all too well which serve to expand the kind of domain or empire of exhibitions onto more and more spaces. Um, our ambition was to organize an exhibition that will be very strongly present beyond particularly confined spaces. And I think this, this is also possible through um, giving particular attention to publications. And this is why we began quite early on with um, the magazine uh, called South as a State of Mind, of which we um, were hoping to have four issues published in the duration of Documenta, and we accomplished that. So these magazines are each around like 250 pages of mostly newly commissioned writing and artistic projects and uh, especially commissioned for the magazine and poetry and, and fiction and documents and so forth. So the production of the magazine was in fact a process parallel to the exhibition. The magazine was co-edited by Quinn Latimer and myself with contributions of all those who were participating in the curatorial team, which is I think more than, I don't know, it's around 15 people who are in the end part of curatorial team of Documenta and many others who are accompanying the magazine. And um, so the fourth issue was produced short, uh, was, was released after, after, shortly after Documenta closed in Kassel on the 17th of September uh, 2017. But uh, what makes me particularly happy is that uh, right now we have another issue of South as a state of mind produced. So this magazine existed before Documenta under the same name. Mm founded by uh, a Greek curator, Marina Fokidis. And Marina con is continuing with the magazine and uh, with various guest editors who are going to be working on, on the subsequent issues. So an example of the South as a state of mind is uh, useful when we think about how Documenta try to engage with existing institutions in Athens. And by institutions, I, I don't only mean 
particular organizational entities such as museums or galleries or similar or foundations. Um, but a magazine is also an institution and also uh, kind of extra institutional um, entities like grassroots organizations. So we, in fact, try to use Documenta in order to, um, to sustain um, the work of institutions in Athens that were very often in precarious situations. So we didn't want to add too much to the existing landscape. We did not want to create new short-lived phenomena um, on the map of Athens, but we wanted rather to, uh, to, to put, put a certain st stress or, or, or to, to give uh, presence, visibility, and some kind of ma material recognition, let's say, um, also by opening these institutions to a large relatively large audience, also international audience and, uh, and um, hundreds of participants uh, in the project who came to Athens during the time of Documenta and also uh, already in the time uh, you know, preceding the opening. Because activities in Athens did not start in 2017. It all started in September 2016 with uh, the opening uh, sessions of um, w what we call Parliament of Bodies, which was sort of in place of what normally goes as public programs of the exhibition. So Parliament of Bodies started its sessions in September um, 2016 in uh, the, the building of um, uh, of former military barracks that then were the site of uh, the, um, the secret police uh, in Greece during the time of military junta uh, between 1967 and 1974. Uh, so this is a historically charged uh, place which was converted into a municipal gallery in the 1980s. And for, for that purpose, sort of uh, fake white walls were constructed around the space. So we did, together with an ar architect and artist, Andreas Angelidakis, a complete redesign of this space, or rather, I would say, de-design, meaning that uh, the walls were, uh, were pierced, and we opened the walls into, into the win onto the windows that, that existed there in this building uh, before. And we also uh, did a sort of, uh, almost like <coughs> archaeological uh, probing of the ceilings, showing the whole infrastructure behind the suspended ceiling and so forth. So we kind of ripped the building open a little bit from the inside. Um, well, here, this is Castle. <coughs> Maybe you can find, uh, yes, this is 34 Exercises of Freedom, the opening sessions of the, um, of the Parliament of, of Bodies. If you, if you click more, perhaps, or, 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 or any video, yeah, it will kind of show the setting, maybe the one on the left. Yeah. Antonio, Antonio Negri. Antonio Negri. Yeah. So, so there's kind of special um, setting inside of the Parco Lefteria uh, building, which Parco Lefteria means the Park of Freedom, uh, ironically. Um, <coughs> bearing in mind it was the site of the secret police during, during the junta uh, period in Greece. Uh, so I just... Uh, Okay. Give the floor to the rest of the participants today. Yes, I, I, I won't invite let Paul uh, speak for too to long. Go to the Parliament of Bodies organized by two today, um, philosopher, writer, um, transgender activist um, Paul Preciado, and this is one of the opening sessions with Antonio Negri. So, as you see, people are um, the the people who are participating in the session of the Parliament are seated on these blocks that are made of very light material that that however looks like uh, blocks of uh, concrete because it's covered with a, with a, with a kind of fabric on which the, the, the picture of concrete is printed. So it's at the same time an image and an uh, object. So it's an image that can be um, um, uh, reconfigured and um, okay. rearranged and and kind of built into several different functional configurations. It could be a, either a scatter of concrete or concrete blocks, or it could be a sort of more like an amphitheater or any other form that, that fitted a given, uh, let's say, uh, program. 
And these programs were uh, different in many. So from more conventional, um, say, lecture or presentation formats to performances to music events to film presentations and many other types of activity. And each night there will be a different architecture of the space um, organized. OK, I, I think we can uh, turn it off. Um, right now. So, but the important thing about the Parliament of uh, Bodies is that it preceded the opening of exhibitions by a good um, seven or eight months even. So Documenta in Athens sl slowly uh, gained presence or it became a kind of part of, of the daily rituals of, of those who were interested in engaging um, with exhibition and its, its, its different projects. And then uh, in the following year, in 2017, I think in April, we began uh, what we called Continuum, which was a series of visits um, by different artists who were invited to, um, um, to make new works uh, for Documenta. And I think over 100 artists visited us uh, as, as of uh, April 2017. And they were hosted in the building um, which is part of the historical campus of the uh, Athens National Technical University or the Polytechnic, Polytechnio. And this is the building where the student uprising against Junta took place in uh, 1973, uh, which was when the uh, police and the military entered the area of the university, also a tank uh, entered the area, forcing through the gate and some students and other uh, protesters or activists were killed either in the area of Polytechnio or in the surrounding area. So it, it's, a, it's a kind of memorial as well. It's a place of uh, learning. It's also a place where, uh, where the final part of the International Congress of Modern Architecture in 1935, which took place between Marseille and then moved over the Mediterranean on a steamship and then ended up culminated in Athens with Le Corbusier and all these modern architects uh, meeting a very young um, Greek modern architects with a slightly different idea of modernism and you know they, they, they had a conference in the uh, in the Polytechnio in the very place which then in 1973 will be uh, uh, a, a main kind of ep the, the epicenter of the student protest in Athens will be occupied one year before the, uh, the the fall of the junta, which happened not exactly due to the uprising of the students, but it happened due to the failed invasion of the right wing, uh, you know, uh, orchestrated by the right wing government of uh, of Greece onto the onto Cyprus, which was then fended off by uh, by uh, Turkey, and as a result, the junta in Greece fell. So, by locating um, this initial, uh, let's say, movements of documenta in these two historic historically charged places, uh, the, the former detention and torture chambers of the military uh, and secret police in the Parque Olefteria and the, the second place, the Polytechnio, where the student uprising was taking place, we, we kind of try to be, albeit for very um, short period or to live through some of the memories that we thought were very often repressed um, in the Greek society and not so uh, familiar to, 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 to the internationals, to, to the foreigners, so to say. Excuse me? Time? Yeah, okay. T ten minutes left. Um, Okay, so that was the initial phase of, uh, of Documenta in, um, in Athens, after which um, the exhibition uh, began. And, uh, okay, uh, to explain, um, the subtitle of, of, of the project, Learning from Athens, uh, was meant always as a, as a kind of working title of the exhibition, and it remained a working title of the exhibition, although since we used it quite consequently, um, many thought that this is the final title of the show, but this is a matter of taste. For me, it was a working title in the sense that it, it, it was this uh, gerund form, the, the learning and not a particular um, r result 
uh, or, or a kind of uh, material effects of the exhibition that matter most. The learning means that you are opening up to practi practically anything, any influence, and you become like a field, like a uh, not a field, but like a locus of of confluence rather um, than a kind of um, transmitter one way of, of certain traditions. So, the, the in the learning process, can we go back uh, a second? Um, we had these several categories here, and each of them has the word public very stubbornly hammered into the website users' heads. So, as if it was enough to make an exhibition, exhibitions seem to be by definition public. Are they? I'm not sure. We call it public exhibition. Um, in this way, we wanted to make a nod or perhaps pay tribute to our public or to the public. It's very difficult to get use of certain habits, for instance, saying like our audience, wh whose audience, to whom does the audience belong, you know. We wanted to say that exhibition is, is just one of many things that are produced, you know, and this production is not a production by a particular cu curatorial team, uh, which is then sort of offered, uh, you know, on, on a plate uh, to a particular audience, because there is something terribly patronizing about this idea of you know, producing something and then giving it to someone, because it's your courtesy, you know. Uh, the, the question is, you know, wh whose courtesy this should be. Second, public programs quite, quite obviously involving a number of participants who are invited or who, let's say, co-produced the initial 34 exercises of freedom and who then participated in creation of associations. And th this is the, um, the slightly different setting of the Parliament of Boris in Kassel, if you can scroll up uh, again to this picture. Um, exactly. So this is um, in um <coughs> Kassel. And there, let's say, the, the, the whole s setting of the Parliament of Boris was made of these blocks that were um, uh, that had this print of camouflage pattern. This is a camouflage pattern of a of a particular uh, type of tank, Leopard uh, tank, which is a number one tank produced by German military um, industries. And these industries are located in Kassel and selling selling these tanks and other military equipment to places like Greece or Qatar. And <coughs> so we built one to one replica, like kind of a slightly simplified replica of a of a tank. Uh, out of these blocks, and this is again a project called um, Polemos, uh, which means the conflict or the war, by, by the Greek artist and architect uh, Andreas Angelidakis. And then uh, before the first session of the parliament, together with artists and, and uh, some people who were already coming to participate in the first session, we just dismantled this tank and we turned it into, into a kind of uh, open seating area in the central spot of um, Museum Frideriziano, which is symbolically like the most important um, um <coughs> place of documenta because this is where Arnold Bore in 1955 in half um, um, in like bombed out building organized the first edition of documenta and this is where famously in the uh, preceding edition of documenta um uh, Christoph Bakarjiev, the artistic director at that time located the um, uh, the, the so-called brain, which was the part of exhibition that kind of condensed certain uh, lines, storylines, topics, but also quite idiosyncratic um, uh, you know, quotations, or uh, it kind of discovered, um, it kind of uncovered something of the. I read it as a as a, as a sort of walk through a curator's brain, um, because exhibition as as an inanimate abstract construct um, doesn't have a brain, but the curator has a brain. So if part of exhibition is called the brain, it's probably the curator's brain. So we replaced this brain with a kind of collective and changing brain of parliament of bodies. We located um, the, the, the meeting place and the place of exchange of ideas and debate and the kind of sometimes very fierce polemic uh, right in the, in the center of the exhibition. In this way, we did affirm um, the kind of centrality of the place, I admit. It might have been better to locate it off-center, but the best ideas often come as a sort of esprit d'escalier 
the, the spirit of the one who descends the stairs, so they come too late. Um, all right, um, I, I think um, I would maybe uh, stop at this point and just ask Natasha to continue a little bit with, you know, bringing it to those questions that you might have had or whatever you want to do, and then we would open to uh, the questions from the floor. Thank you, Adam. Um, we had also discussed that it would be, um, you can't see me, but I, I have to sit here to just show you some, to kind of create some more threads that actually run through the um, artistic projects that reveal to you more on the methodology um, that was pursued across both cities. Uh, so as Adam was uh, revealing to us, uh, the artists were starting to visit the two cities uh, a year uh, before uh, Documenta 14 opened in Athens. And the strategy was also to think with them of what it meant to respond in this way to these two, um, these two kind of coexisting lines of, of traumatic uh, reality and traumatic realism that actually uh, run through Europe today. And um, the ways in which they would uh, foreground their life work in, uh, in this scenario. So it wasn't, so when I just wanted to mention that when we sort of work with um, somebody like uh, an artist such as Akin Bode Akinbi, he is a photographer who would actually walk through the streets of Athens over several weeks and find relationships um, between Athens and other cities in the world that he has lived and walked through. Um, and so the, the idea was also not to um, enter into the reality um, of Athens through this sort of ex exterior eye, but to really think through what it meant for these artists um, to be in both, uh, both cities for a significant amount of time. Um, it also meant when we deal with sort of an artist such as Rashid Arin, um, to think about his contributions uh, in terms of third text, to think about his contributions, his early uh, works, uh, which we showed in Kassel, but in Athens, it meant actually creating this space. Um, I don't know, Adam, if you want to mention a little bit about... Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, Rashid Arin's projects, which are kind of both new, new projects, especially this is definitely <coughs> something that I, I think he has not he had not uh, tried before, uh, Shamiyana, Food for Thought, and then the other project was basically a presentation uh, on the kind of modular structure that, that we know from Rashid Arin's work since, since the late 60s of all, all existing issues of the third text magazine in, uh, in Kassel, right, with, with, let's say, a number of uh, new paintings of a, of a kind that he's been doing over the last um, decade, I, I suppose. So bluntly, one could say, uh, you know, this was practice, and and third text is the theory of that practice, you know. So so it was kind of like a very uh, uh, sly uh, play on on the idea of kind of division between the theory and practice, Be because this this here was was a was a kind of uh, tent which had a ki kitchen in the center and over a period of 100 days of documenta it served I think around 100 free meals, uh, about 100 free meals to anyone uh, you know, c uh, coming. So people could, would queue up, uh, receive a ticket and then they could have a free meal and this was going on for, for 100 days non-stop. While if you can g go to the <coughs> castle, uh, castle presentation, here for 100 days, you, you, you could, you know, those who came to that part of the exhibition in in um, in what we call the new new gallery of Castle, which is the old uh, disused post office building in Castle, the logistical center of the of the German um, post. Um, uh, so so the visitors could could actually read from uh, all these issues of third text, which were the issues. Uh, um, f from the entire period when Rashid Arin was first founding editor and then uh, editor in chief of uh, of of the magazine, yeah. So this was just an example of uh, 
in which way the tension between the project or projects realized by one artist in two different cities could be read if you were aware of, of both um, uh, projects in both cities. Yeah, these are uh, all historical artists uh, in the exhibition. And we tried not to, you know, not not to count uh, artists in the show. And I must also say that the full list of artists was not known to each of the members of the team until very late. So there was a lot of internal speculation <laughs> as a principle. So yeah, we, we, we were not working with something like artist list. We eliminated that. We were working with uh, specific clusters of artists who were in many cases brought by, by different participating um, curators or curatorial advisors and we try to organize meanings within these clusters and then find connections and not to care so much about kind of alphabetic list. So this, this was done posteriorly only uh, for the use of the website and for, you know, for, for all kind of practical use because we, don't, we did not want to complicate the matter further for our visitors, but we just didn't want to, uh, to create this condition of transparency and the kind of production of the exhibition according to a alphabetic list of 153 artists uh, for the team working on um, on Documenta. We wanted to kind of destabilize this moment of, of setting up uh, of, the, of the exhibition. You want to talk about Yeah, if I want to uh, talk about this, yeah. Uh, if you could go back one, maybe? No? No. This is uh, Castle or Athens? Is there a picture of the path itself? Okay, anyway. So, um, th these are photographs and drawings by Dimitri Picionis, and uh, during this uh, International Congress of Modern Architecture, Dimitri Picionis was, uh, was a young architect in Greece, and he was one of those who were speaking during the, uh, the Congress next to the world famous architects of international modernism. Um, and uh, he was a proponent of what then became known as critical regionalism, which was kind of critical correction um, uh, initiated, I, I believe, uh, by, the, by those young Greek architects to, to, to the, the sort of universal sameness of international modernism that was kind of uh, lacking the recognition of, uh, um, of the local um, context. And uh, so what Picanis proposed was to take into account the local building traditions and also the climate, um, the, the condition of, uh, of the site and the kind of historical conditions. So the, the, the context in its many dimensions, not only kind of material dimensions of the context, but also the kind of historical depth and maybe also to a degree a kind of political constraints of every context in which um, an edifice or a work of architecture is built. So in the exhibition, we, we showed a number of uh, photographs from, from, from the time when in uh, 54, uh, between 1954 and 57, Picionis was um, commissioned to kind of design a system of uh, footpaths on the hills of Philopapu Hill, uh, from which you see the Acropolis. It's the Hill of Muses, from which you see the Acropolis and, and uh, on the slopes of Acropolis as well. And he, he used the paths that were shepherd's paths uh, for centuries. So he did not impose a design of his own. He did not, he did not landscape the landscape, you know. So, so this idea of landscaping uh, as a kind of incursion was rejected, and, and a certain passivity of design was introduced instead. And I, I think th this, this was something from which we learned a lot also in terms of how to situate works uh, within the exhibition. You know, rather than imposing, try to, to go with. So uh, Picionis then uh, built his path out of uh, what we could call spolia, uh, fragments. Um, fragments of both uh, the rubble uh, of buildings destroyed or demolished after the Second World War in Athens, but also some um, 
um, ancient uh, uh, pieces of broken uh, clay pottery uh, found here and there in Athens. So, so basically, he created a hu huge horizontal sculptures on which to walk. You know, and this is kind of predating uh, uh, works of. Uh, say, minimal artists. Uh, Carl Andre once said that he's very near to the idea of a sculpture as a road. You know, sculpture as a road, not as an object, but as something to, to walk on. So Picciolis realized that in 54, 57, um, uh, you know, good 10 years before uh, minimal sculpture was supposedly invented. In the US, um, if we don't agree on the fact that it was Rashid Arin who proposed this kind of modular system uh, well before US minimalism. So uh, somewhere on this path of Picciolis, there's also a, t uh, a small church built by, by this architect um, at the beginning of the path. And next to the church is this kind of uh, open air tea pavilion. And there uh, we showed works by uh, Vivian Suter, who is a Swiss artist living in Guatemala since early 1980s, and she in uh, and she sort of uh, you know her her studio is uh, in the in the j jungle basically on a slope of a hill in a small village in Guatemala, uh, and this is a former coffee plantation completely overgrown uh, with uh, kind of tropical plants and she's painting partly in a in a kind of shack that she constructed as her studio partly just outside and in a similar way she was painting in this place called Nisiros which is a small island that is like just a cone of a volcano that is still fuming but it's apparently not going to erupt anymore so th th this is the scenery in which these paintings were created so they were just painted on canvas unstretched la laid on the ground uh, sort of in situ, in the crater uh, of the volcano, you know, with kind of sulfuric fumes in the background and kind of surrounding the artist and maybe giving her a particular high during the process. And then uh, we thought that to, to sort of imprison these paintings in, <coughs> in a gallery would be a pity and this marvelous location of the Picciolis pavilion that is on the one hand protected from, uh, you know, by the sunroof, on the other hand, completely open to the surrounding of the Filopapu Hill. So the paintings were there, and they were also you know, gently moving as the wind was blowing. So there was a really um, uh, kind of situated installation of paintings. And the second, is, uh, the second installation is <coughs> in Kassel. So here, the paintings were installed in, um, f there, was a s there was a number of, the, a row of, um, uh, of small pavilions adjoining a residential and office building. And they used to have commercial function, but since they were terribly overheating during summer, they were slowly abandoned. And right now, they are standing empty. <coughs> and the building is slated for demolition. And I, I suppose it should be demolished in, in the coming years. And so we used uh, these pavilions for a number of works, and Vivian Suter ar arranged her and her mother's um, Elizabeth Wild uh, work um, uh, in, in, in that pavilion in Kassel. So you kind of, here you see a, a kind of scaled down version of a, of a modernist building with all walls transparent, like in the Neue National Gallery in Berlin, for instance, here reduced to the scale of a commercial pavilion. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll just, I think I'll s stop here and we can open to questions from the audience.
just wanted to sort of so add one comment um, before opening up to questions. Um, and then in the examples that, that we gave, which were very limited, as you could see, there's sort of a longer list of, um, of artists and, and, and other practitioners. The fact was really to think about how, when we want to stage a public exhibition, what it means to um, think about these different edges and landscapes of an artist's uh, life. And, and that also meant their poetry, um, their educational strategies, um, their activism. Um, and to have these two locations and to perform um, to sort of be in sync and sometimes out of sync with what these two locations were and what their um, the conditions of reality are in the everyday um, also meant that we could give form to and access uh, to those practitioners various ways of being. Um, so I just sort of wanted to mark that and that, that is how it also manifests across these different channels which included sort of radio, television, uh, programming, etc. Um, so there'll be other ways to sort of make that clear to you and, and really the website is a resource uh, to be used, so hope hope that you can spend some more time with it um, after this presentation. So more questions uh, from the audience? Yeah. Can we start here? Start here? Okay. Hello. It's a very simple question. I am taking on from what you said about learning from Athens, learning as a gerundative form, i.e. something in potentia and something that is prompted by uh, existing networks and institutions. So I was curious about the afterlife of this after Documenta folds up and the possibilities of sustaining such networks, institutions. One of the examples being South as a State of Mind, the magazine. Could you elaborate a little about other possibilities? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, of course, we, we don't know what would have happened if Documenta did not uh, take place in Athens because it, it did happen. And um, uh, this uh, paradox, I think, illustrates the difference between an experiment uh, which is conducted in vivo and the experiment that is conducted in vitro. Y you know, in one case, you, you have uh, an idea of of the very fact that that you are experimenting, you're you're doing something, you decide to make a move, uh, which is already changing the conditions of the process. So the fiction of objectivity and all the what ifs, uh, I, I I just don't believe. Uh, you know, that this is the way to go. We we did influence the course of things in Athens for good and bad, probably. Um, th there are risks involved for both sides in every encounter. Uh, the encounter took place, um, the results are yet to be seen and some of them are already seen. I think uh, in the first place, in comparison to my impression of a number of institutions that we engage with, is that they are doing a uh, little better in the sense that, that we uh, managed to kind of uh, walk together for a while and then there was a kind of hunger for, for more, and they continued. So in a sense, for instance, the um, Odeon Athenon, the Athens Con Conservatoire, the, the music conservatory of uh, Athens, which was one of the cent central venues of the exhibition, is continuing with rather interesting program that has more and more, um, let's say, explicit uh, um, collaborations or um, relations with the field of contemporary art and kind of engages with larger field of contemporary culture than just, uh, let's say, contemporary uh, music. Um, then there's a, a couple of institutions that I think are also um, using the infrastructure that was produced for Documenta and one of them is uh, the Athens School of Arts, where we basically created a, a kind of uh, exhibition architecture and also we built uh, some technical infrastructure in, in the so-called Kasanlis Hall, which is an exhibition space of in the campus of the Athens School of Fine Arts. And this is being now used for, I think, third or fourth exhibition that the school uh, 
is organizing. Either with students, they are also organizing uh, other kinds of exhibitions with contemporary artists or um, 20th century, like um, post-war <laughs> artists. Uh, so there are some uh, some small practical improvements that we were able to afford and that remained, which I think are important because they're kind of like material uh, remainder of, uh, of, of the exhibition. Then there's two or three public artworks that remain in the city space. Um, we were not able to, I mean, most of them were of rather ephemeral nature, um, such as uh, Rashid Arin's work in Kotsia Square. Um, then I think uh, there is a lot of uh, immaterial um, um, kind of Adam, residual effect. If I could just add that the, the fact was also that there was in our last newsletter there was actually a list of projects that would continue and one was also Riklo's Victoria Square project and the idea of having the open form societies was also because there was obviously this connection of stakeholders from across across Athens who were working in different fields who could not only participate but also take on these structures and continue them in different ways. So there actually are projects um, and the infrastructure of course cannot be taken for granted because that, that actually was a limitation that would freeze such spaces earlier. Mm. I had a uh, question. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting uh, part is congratulations for putting up a very, very fascinating encounter in the last one year. I just, uh, there's this book that you did, the documentary reader. I think it's Quentin Letima and you edited. There is this idea of the folio by which you structure the. Yeah. the mm -hmm. So it is more like uh, if Carl Andre wants a sculpture as a road, it's more like walking, curation as walking, mm -hmm. walking through historical uh, detours, amnesias, you know, like material. And there's one on food which I think people sh could hear, uh, hear access it is brilliantly where it tells the story of from Chittu Prasad to hunger to trauma. It's very interesting. On your web, uh, see this, uh, because the folio is something that I've, I use as a conversation with people, artists, students, because it allows uh, a kind of opening up of this certain stitching of the 20th century, mm -hmm. a certain re-stitching. Re yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a actually a very beautiful, uh, I think one of the most powerful uh, way to unlock the exhibition and the creative processes mm -hmm. that you all went through. But the website is a very traditional idea of, this, of the site. The, and I, that, that is very uh, peculiar about this document. Uh, I think there is this idea of the, because when, see, I come from a, I set up a Sarayo, the reason is the web will free me from the textuality of the book. Mm -hmm. But in this document, uh, the freedom is experienced in the folio of the book. The web looks like, a, like a, you're trapped. The trapped in the logic of the individual artist, trapped in the logic of a exhibitory practice, trapped in the logic of the public. In the folio, there is almost no public, but I can read hundreds in it. So I, I was just wondering whether the institution of document and the curatorial, uh, what do you call, investigation, joy, and, and conversation, they kind of split, joy and split, or is it that that this is too part of the, that there is an explicatory form where artists can see themselves uh, and then there is this curatorial form which is little shy but which actually opens up a new walk. So I'm just mm. wondering, with, because there it is in the tension of documenters own history, mm. Daniel Burian's attack on uh, Zimmerman, you know, like that you know you are doing a great, <coughs> you are doing your documenter, not our documenter, you know that that tension is always there in the curatorial. So I was just wondering because this, uh, I would, I don't go to this website with when I am working with younger artists or students. I go to the folio, and I why do I go to the folio? If you you read it, you know I can. If you have it, you can read the hunger hunger one. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant piece of thinking. So I just, I was just wondering what is this tension? I'll give you one example. Just uh, uh, 2002, 2007. In a lot of 
people from India gone to documenta. I once attended three, four such uh, talks. The artists presenting the document experience is as if they had gone done a solo show. Mm. <laughs> and this is some that is something completely perplexed me always. You are surrounded by ten exceptionally brilliant people around what you are showing, but they present it as they have done a solo show. So and but this website <laughs> induces that feeling. But the folio will never make you do that mistake. So I'm just wondering, you know, because you guys have been working for five years and now I think next four or five years it will unfold. Just wondering, what is this tension about? Yeah. I just wanted to say one, one, add one thing before Adam takes over. Um, just that in, in your observation, just wanted to mention that there are sort of sections within the website, um, such as notes and works, which is actually quite an important um, structure like the folio, I find it a very important tool where notes and works is also a section where for instance it goes from um, you know somebody who is uh, an artist such as Nikhil Chopra who is doing a project where he is basically traveling on the road from Athens to Kassel and can make an insertion. Um, it, it sadly also became the space where we were writing memoriams for artists who had passed away during the time of Documenta. I agree that it sort of looks quite formal, but it is also the space where a lot of um, a lot of the production, a lot of the, the voice of the artists and the thinkers that we were working with was also getting inserted. Um, so kind of moving just beyond the interface, it, it is, there are these kind of uh, pockets which one can read laterally that really open up the structure and um, that I feel sort of also kind of move away. For instance, so you have the Hallucination Cinema Festival. It really mixes up programming um, together with sort of artist writing uh, with the sort of obituary format, the memoriam. Um, and so that's just something I wanted to highlight, not at all as a way of sort of, uh, uh, it's not a way of comparing. The folio really was its own uh, kind of form, which uh, Adam should talk about, which he uh, worked on with Quinn. Um, but so for instance, just mentioning so sort of Andre Pierre, who is this uh, incredible uh, painter, who is you know, an, a real inspiration for Maya Duran, for instance. If you could just open that page, um, what we have here is we invited a poet, Vladimir Lucien, to write a Caribbean poet to write about Andre Pierre, who is a Haitian painter and a priest. So he is writing um, as a poet, responding to these paintings that get shown within the exhibition. So I sort of just wanted to mention how there is this kind of scattering, um, moving beyond the temporality of what is shown, um, inviting encounters from the outside, readings from the outside, um, to to enable a different kind of publicness. Um, Adam, take over now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, no, just very briefly, I, I, I think uh, um, the structure of both the reader and daybook is, is, is complex and, and it's, it's, um, it was our um, aim to, um, to rather use the mode of uh, enumeration on the website to create lists. There is a list of venues, there is a clear division between the two cities and then there is a way of, uh, of sort of cross those lists through the website, so you can, you, they kind of like interlinked those lists. But the, yes, I, I admit that the website was thought rather from the book or, you know, from the printed medium um, into the website rather than the website informing the process. Because the website, in a way, in its full-fledged form came the, the latest. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting because the, the printed publications, they always come, they, mu they must they must come too early, they are kind of premature because you have to have them ready well in advance of the exhibition and a lot of things are happening in the last three months when everything is already in, in, in print. And then the website comes sort of, you know, with a slight delay or it's kind of completed only at the end of the show or even after. So there is this kind of gap between these two, b between the printed medium and the kind of uh, web-based uh, which, which I think is precisely the gap in, into which the exhibition or the, the thing itself kind of falls. And, and I think that this is also showing a certain, I would say, irreducibility uh, of, of the experience, of the aesthetic experience um, of the exhibition itself, which I wouldn't like to see a, as a kind of illustration or, or maybe a, 
demonstration of a certain thesis that is you know, formulated in advance or that can be analyzed <coughs> a, a posteriori, but, but it's a kind of experience in its own right. And this 100 days uh, of the exhibition in Athens and then 100 days in, At in Kassel, altogether 163 days, that period was, was the period of, of, of a sort of unclarity which had to be slowly sorted uh, by visitors themselves and of course through different programs and you know through the kind of accompanying uh, discussion and through the activities of the of the members of the so-called course of the commenta that we created to kind of walk with and talk to um, uh, the visitors of the exhibition uh, th this this initial obscurity of, of the show which which is not uh, it's not it's, 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 it's not uh, clarified um, by the publications, so, so the publications further complicate the picture or complexify it, um, and it's also uh, not really explained through the website. So there's a kind of moment in which the the website, the publications, and the exhibitions are standing on their own, uh, and and kind of talking perhaps about same things but fr in entirely different ways. So I, I agree, the website is 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 a little. Um, little different here and it also kind of contains um, in a slightly different form you know almost everything that that was published for instance the text from the from the day book um, about individual artists or or the entire content in three languages Greek German and English of four issues of the South magazine also kind of contained so the website is more like a repository like a like a kind of storage but for um, ideas or archive just to go to the form of language, because that was something that Adam was instructing. Um, there was one of the points at which he was very um, kind of firm on, which I, I learned a lot from, which was whether when we were writing about artists, um, exactly, it wasn't exactly that. It was exactly not that. It wasn't about in that sense of the <laughs> biography. So if you even if you go to any of those pages, what you read is really a kind of encounter and a narrative with that artist. Um, and often the, the, those who were writing uh, those short texts were not simply the curatorial team. And so even the forms and the sort of use of language around artistic practice um, was something that was done um, quite differently in, in, in this edition. So it really wasn't sort of about, yeah, I mean, you, that's something you'll see. And also when you scroll actually below that uh, artist page, if you just go below, what you see is a kind of resource and that was sort of the style of interlinking where you sort of um, see what is, what, what is related. Um, and I think there as well you find this kind of corpus um, of, of pages and spheres of activity um, that the exhibition <coughs> brought together. And that's where I think you kind of move from this um, kind of solo thread into the different directions of practice. Um, so just something uh, that I sort of wanted to add. Um, and also the chorus. Uh, when Adam talked about the chorus and what it meant to continue that practice from the website to the publication and then actually into the space of the exhibition. The chorus literally produced different readings of the exhibition throughout the day, every single day. Yeah, um. and the chorus also produced this bug, which is <laughs> asking an important question uh, to everybody in the industry, uh, including our uh, viewers, uh, outside of this room, uh, the bag was produced by the mem mem anonymous members of the Documenta Chorus in uh, in Kassel, I think, on their own initiative. Feel free to ask me about my working conditions. I think this is an uh, important issue addressed here on the kind of edge of a big exhibition project of a kind of uh, precarity of um, of uh, working conditions of all those who are. Um, participating in the making of the commenta both on the artist side and on the kind of uh, curator side and the entire team side, those who built the exhibition, those who communicated the exhibition to the public, those who raised money for the exhibition and to, and to them I should simply thank, but I don't know how to thank them because I think what they did was completely beyond what, uh, you know, it was not a superhuman achievement and I, I don't glorify this achievement. I think it's rather sad that working on, on, on a project of this um, uh, magnitude or importance or, 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 
potentially of significance, one has to um, daily cope with, uh, with very unpleasant uh, conditions of, of precarity of work that is kind of imposed by the structure of the organization or by the structure of salaries and so forth, which motivates those who in the end, you know, uh, carry this project, sustain it. Those, for instance, who are exhibition attendants or guards and those who are supposed to be, you know, walking with the visitors like the members of chorus to have serious issues of very practical or economic nature with the exhibition and, and I think I think this is also something that apart from you know the ideas that the exhibition wants to communicate should be taken care of because an exhibition that is built on wrong principles cannot uh, deliver the right content you know um, and I think that this is an issue not all in particular of documenta so I don't want to accuse anyone uh, in particular, but, but I think the way the industry functions and that we implicitly uh, accept the fact that we are kind of willfully um, exploited in the process of making of these exhibitions is just something that, that, that should not be uh, taking place. So maybe the scaling down on a certain refusal um, to the expectations should be the, uh, the response, you know. So I wish the next documenta is is, is, is aware of these constraints already at the outset and it doesn't kind of produce the overblown expectation and uh, it, that it doesn't, you know, deliver what it is to deliver um, um, at any cost, you know. So this cost has to be very carefully calculated beforehand and, uh, the, you know, the amount of work and time that we can put in this project is, projects is, is always very limited but but I think we have to make sure that it's kind of adequate to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, basically to the salary. You know, it's a salaried work and we are doing this work, all of us. So. Um, this is Lely, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask, how did you feel that Documenta um, can navigate or, sorry, has navigated and or mitigated the performative difference of within and without positions in South as a state of mind, particularly the articles with by Jolene Rickard and Candace Hopkins and others, um, and in the folio, particularly the trans uh, Maori writers, uh, Maori writer Emily Rakete's text on Papa Nuku, the Earth Mother and Transhumanism, which was first published in Auckland University Art History Students Journal, um, and kind of like the Northern consumption of the South. I think South is really in vogue in Europe, but the uh, positionality, even from Athens, is still like. I'm just uh, interested in how indigeneity is like performative in this context and consumptive. Thanks. Should we take two more questions? Yeah, okay. There's a question at the back here. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess just in, to maybe it's a question towards a more practical conversation about what it means to produce such a vast body of public knowledge or to kind of fold in radio, TV, and ongoing publication. Because I think maybe some kind of anecdotal or practical conversation about what, what it actually means to work with institutions or states on such a huge level. I think it's interesting in particularly in the context of having this conversation in the na Indian nation state where I can, you know, I, I feel like it's quite difficult to imagine a project of this scale or seeing the state perhaps be amicable to the idea. Um, hi, I'm Arpit. Uh, my question comes from just being a spectator uh, and, and a participant at uh, Documenta. Uh, so, a comment and a question. The comment is that, you know, as Jupe said, I attended Documenta and then when I came back after a month or so, I opened the day book and every day I used to look at one artist. And it totally unlocked the way I had seen the exhibition, you know, because there were these black boxes and uh, they had something, I think, uh, it's what you call encounter, it's what you... Uh, You're calling encounter. And it was really interesting. I, I literally found a new way to relook at the same things I had looked at in the exhibition. 
Um, my question is in, it's, it's a very simple question. Um, in my experience of document, I spent about four days in Kassel, and uh, I came back and I have, have a group of artists I discussed with the, this with, and we all said, you know, it was so tiring. It was very exhausting, you know. We were spending uh, morning to night, we were just running around from one place to the next, uh, and trying to find things, navigating the fact that you didn't know German, all kinds of things. And they said it's supposed to be exhausting. Uh, it's exhausting by design. And I just wanted to ask you, <laughs> is, 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 is that true? Last question. Last question. Please pass on to Bharti. Hello. Uh, my name is Bharti. And uh, I was wondering that once documents are open to the public, uh, you know, a, a number of uh, critiques uh, were launched on your curatorial positions. Uh, so my question is, uh, you know, what sort of criticisms uh, did you think held merit? Held? Merit. Merit. Uh, I mean, apart from the cost and everything, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about curatorial position. So a, a critique on your, uh, you know, how your uh, curatorial uh, vision unfolded uh, both in Castle and uh, Athens. Like what we did wrong? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not talking about uh, assumptions or uh, I'm not talking about errors. You, you want me to reiterate uh, positions of our uh, creators? I, I am talking about uh, perspectives, you know, perhaps something uh, that was something a very different quick. perspective. What was also useful in yeah. terms of criticism that still holds purpose and that perhaps also inspires our continuing work, right? I mean, yeah, you know, you criticism know, does that. Exactly. Okay, Ma maybe I can, uh, uh, you know, we can, we can begin with, with this question that is very fre fresh now. Um, I think the ongoing problem is, is how to negotiate the, the, the kind of, uh, um, yeah, the moment of an encounter with the other, you know, in, in any sense. Yeah, like this is this is the the, the kind of threshold, uh, which is very difficult to uh, you know. It's a simple step, uh, as as in Neil Armstrong's famous saying, you know, landing on on the moon, maybe a small step but big trouble. Uh, it, it's a it's a it's a kind of a very tricky situation which has to be explained over and over, and I think it's a kind of ritual that has to be repeated over and over. So it, it, you know, the moment of, of, of getting familiar with something that you weren't familiar with before, this is the most fragile moment in the entire process. Because I could have chosen to, to stay on a safe side and just rely on a kind of repertoire, which one could say was those exhibitions and projects that I developed over 10 years in Basel. And then my, you know, uh, natural kind of genealogy in, in my, you know, in, in the place to which I ethnically sort of belong or used to belong, which is, well, I guess belong if we engage with notions of ethnicity, um, uh, which is Poland and the whole tradition of the Fox Hall Gallery Foundation, all I know about art and so on. I, I could have like just, you know, dumped it into this exhibition. I'm <laughs> sure something relatively interesting would have come out, I, I presume, perhaps. Uh, instead, um, I chose a different way, which was from the very beginning um, to kind of abandon speaking from the I position and start speaking from the we position, but not in order to hide myself in this kind of forest of you know, curatorial practices and thoughts, but in order to, to enable um, a, a kind of multiplicity in the way of, uh, of uh, approaching subjects that you know, they were kind of screaming for attention, but they were not approachable uh, for one person only because the competence is lacking, the time is lacking, the resources are lacking, and so forth. So you kind of multiply. You, uh, one could say you delegate, but delegating is, is the word which I don't like because it's from the kind of um, um, management language. So um, I don't like that. I, uh, I don't have a name for it. But I, I think it's a kind of, kind of coming together of, of different knowledges and, and voices, like manners of speaking, so to say. Each of us participating in, in kind of bringing this exhibition together had a different voice, you know, different education, different background, different interests, different political ideas, perhaps. There was no uh, single common uh, denominator, which doesn't mean that it was just like a basket full of all kinds of different things, because 
there were in the process these constellations or am amalgamations forged uh, in the exhibition. And I think the folios that you were mentioning before are traces of, of some of those. You know, the folios do not contain the full visual script of the project, you know, divided across the kind of traditional art historical categories. So this photo is a kind of ahistorical, partly, very consciously, and very playfully, also very joyfully, I would say. That's maybe what makes them interesting. It, the, the, um, you know, it's just like showing the method that could be developed further, because more folios could be added. You know, these folio, folios, you know, for instance, the one dedicated to, to the hung, hunger issue, um, they are not exhausting all themes of the exhibition. So you could find more things in the exhibition that, that were in, in the publication. And I think that, that you know some of the critiques that you were asking about were very much focu focusing on this issue of, of, of the apparently colonial gesture of uh, of conquering Athens with documenta, you know, which is basically <laughs> reducing all living participants of the exhibitions to being kind of functionaries of an institution who are like robots, you know. Uh, and I I just disagree with that. I think the institutional format can can be used to very opposite ends, and we try to to kind of undo these mechanics of the encounter, you know, Germany, Greece, North, South, on the living example of the body of this exhibition and the process that led, led to it. And I think if we accomplished something of it, the, the kind of possibility of an encounter, that I guess would be my response to critiques, you know. The response to, to critiques would be not to see the exhibition as an abstraction, but kind of go into the flesh of it. And, and its many manifestations. I guess, uh, you know, th this is the most uh, valid point of critics, but this point is not a new point. It's a point which appears, for instance, in the very brilliant essay that Jean Fisher wrote about the exhibition of Magicien de la Terre uh, back in the 1980s, where she basically criticizes a kind of curatorial approach of Jean-Louis Martin, you know, who travels the world to, to, to kind of collect the artists who are sort of half indigenous and, you know, they're outside of the art system and so forth. And we said, you know, there's no, we want to erase this difference, but not forget it, but, but to, to, to make uh, a possibility of circulation between the different sectors of the artwork and what is outside of the artwork possible in order to be able to, to perhaps look at artistic production in an unmediated way, in the way that is not mediated by any particular one system, be it academia, or art world, you know, because from the point from the uh, academia is also a safe place from which you you, you can you know speak at length on, on different theories of like you know you can look at indigenous art, transgender art. Each of them has has their place, which is already firmly a part of the modern academia. So so we wanted to to mix these things, you know, in order to take privileges from each of these systems of knowledge. You know, one of them is is the art world, the other one is academia. Okay, not I wanted to mention just one um, piece of writing, um, since Bati is a, a very diligent critic. Um, there was this extremely detailed essay by Andrew Weiner, who is a professor in NYU and uh, right, uh, editor of Art Margins. And I just wanted to, I mean, just wanted to mention this essay uh, by Andrew, uh, who took his students to Athens and Kassel and had time to meet with artists um, and you know alongside his students and later he produced this this essay that took me you know an entire day to read and to go into uh, which was um, commissioned for, by the Biennial Foundation and I realized that these sort of um, moments of critical reception first of all can only come after one has had this kind of exhausting relationship with such a project. Um, the worst, of course, is when you start with such a project uh, well in advance, uh, then in a sense um, that is the expectation, but then that is also when you're sort of butchered, you know, sort of it's like, okay, so this is what is happening, we're already criticizing one year before, and then what's very disappointing is when that criticism basically stays the same with different headlines for about two years. Um, and here, uh, just, and Andrew had very valid points, uh, which impact even how I would make an exhibition uh, from, you know, this day on. Um, but it really came after uh, a, a very thorough reading of, of the exhibition and of uh, taking the initiative of taking the sort of next generation of practitioners through it as well. 
Yeah, the, the idea that that an exhibition, for instance, uh, like Documenta, uh, you know, can be apprehended and uh, and comprehended in its totality, it's it's one of the delusions that are uh, you, you know constantly produced by, by by the spectacle culture, and therefore a visitor, I think, in an exhibition of this kind. Uh, has a chance to to choose ways of moving through the landscape. You know, it is not about grasping the total number of artworks within the two days visit to an exhibition. Um, the the viewer, visitor, guest we were thinking about, uh, s someone whom we imagine as you know coming to an exhibition in Athens or Kassel would would, would be a, a person who, having done. You know some initial, uh, let's say, research or, or reading on, like, what, you know, what is there to see would, would make some choices, and this is fine. I, I I don't think that it's possible to to see 35 venues of the show in in you know uh, th uh, three days. And of course, some people like to see everything, and they, they decided to stay a week if they had means to do so. Some other people, some very important curators came to an exhibition and saw it in three hours and made their opinion, you know? So there are like different ways of, of, of seeing, you know? So, so how, how you move in the exhibition, the experience of moving through it, it, it is something that is in the end going to, uh, to have some influence on your, you know, um, uh, impression, let's say, if not the judgment you make um, on the show. So, but I also like the idea uh, of design of exo exhaustion. I must say I'm quite, you know, because it's kind of like inverting the purpose of the good design, you know, like good design should make us, uh, you know, it should be ergonomic, it should be, uh, it, it must sich anpassen, it, it has to adjust itself to, to us humans, you know, it has to first kind of think a human, like design a human and then to, to make a design that makes it possible to sit on this, I guess, Ar you know, post Arne Jacobsen or so chair. Uh, in, in such a way that we feel comfortable, but but y you know there's a counter design of exhaustion, w which I think is something to explore in exhibitions of that kind as a kind of subversive mean to showing their spectacular nature and upsetting the expectation of totality uh, that is to be comprehended in such exhibition. Uh, Adam, would you like to quickly answer the other two questions? Um, we are only answering these two questions and then we are basically going on to a break. Yeah, I'm going step by step. Um, uh, with regard to a possibility, uh, I understood, Sky, your quest question. You know, in, I, I think in 1955 it was very unlikely, I mean maybe it's a, it's a very simple um, example or maybe it's a rhetorical Manover that I'm doing now, but I, I would say in 1955 it was not very likely that a, a large exhibition of uh, modern art would happen I in a s relatively small and completely destroyed German city. You know, so I'm not saying that there is a you know exact symmetry uh, between Castle 1955 and a place in India in 2018. But I've been to Kochi, and I think it's a fairly accomplished, large exhibition, very you know, beautifully uh, done, uh, the edition that I saw, and also the, the completely amazing uh, spaces. So, so I guess, you know, <laughs> there is always ways of, of, of doing things despite circumstances, and, and maybe, maybe in spite of circumstances, so kind of against circumstances. And I, I, I guess uh, it, it might sound a little abstract, the problems that I mentioned with Documenta regarding the, 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 f the financial situation and so forth, because we supposedly had so much money. But, you know, uh, we, we had this budget of 35 million euro, which we exceeded. And, and I think that in order to, uh, to realize the exhibition in its full uh, dimension in both cities and all this other areas it engaged, it, it did need this money. And I also remember from, from your presentation uh, y yesterday, uh, the kind of notion of uh, sp uh, spendings in, in the culture f field versus the kind of general you know, I increase in, in the economy or, or, or the kind of wealth increase. And I think the numbers we are talking about, you know, 35 million spent on an exhibition are not shocking at all. And they should not feel us 
ashamed of spending so much of taxpayers' money for an exhibition because this is still, you know, b below uh, a, a price of a modern tank. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, wh what are we talking about? You know, we have to really start seriously ma make comparisons of prices. What you pay for for culture. You know, which uh, cult cultural manifestation that that involves thousands of people, thousands of people on the producer's side, if there is such side, and a, a million people on, uh, and more than a million people, because you have you have the the ra radio uh, and and TV audience and and those who read something, you know, those who are affected. It's a huge field that is affected by an exhibition. It doesn't kill anyone, okay? And because <laughs> thirty-six. Uh, million euro, I don't see why it should not cost 36 million euro if you compare a kind of, you know, simple deal of selling like uh, arm, uh, armored vehicles yeah. to a country, you know, you, you have uh, loads of money being turned around and I, I don't think there is a convincing way of, of arguing that that money should not be spent this way and it should be spent on, on f for instance, you know, increasing the military potential of a, of a country that is otherwise uh, you know, not providing basic services to, to its citizen or is struggling to provide such services. But nevertheless spending tons of money for, for, uh, for its army, you know. Yeah. Uh, here I have a problem because could you, could you reiterate your question? I, I did not quite, you know, uh, I, I did not see the kind of question part in it. Just kind of asking whether, um, other than the indigenous people who were involved in the exhibition or who attended mm -hmm. from different delegations mm -hmm. from around the world, and Sami people who live in Tsapmi in Northern Europe, the kind of within audience of a lot of indigenous art exhibitions that uh, happen all around the world, and the kind of without kind of this, like, you know, it's kind of, Okay, guys, so I'm just trying to understand. I know Candice was one of the curatorial advisors, but I'm wondering how, as an organization, this may have shifted your working methodologies because indigenous art practices predate modern Europe and will post-date modern Europe. Mm -hmm. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of, of the important moments for me was when we uh, went to the uh, Sami uh, country, North Norway, and then we, together with some artists and, and some, <coughs> some others, visited this, you know, then uh, already defunct kind of um, artist uh, residency building. So there was a Sami artist residency in the <coughs> 1980s, which was abandoned in the 1990s. And we were, uh, you, you know, they showed it to us as a kind of monument, in fact. And they, you know, they told us stories like which artists were working there. And literally, you could still see, you know, the, the artist materials on, on tables and layer of dust. And the building was there, but it was like a ghost of the building not used since, since 10 years. So the, uh, my natural reaction and those who were with me was to say, like, you know, why, uh, why don't you do something now? You know, it, it's, it's a very good moment to do it. And, and did this absolutely worked. So this this studio in um, uh, what's the name of the place? Masi? No, um, Maze. Yeah, in a place called Maze, in a village uh, called Maze. Th th this studio is going to be now turned into a foundation, and it's a joint initiative of the Sami people, who uh, basically donated the building and. Uh, Probably the governments or cultural institutions of the three countries of Scandinavia where the Sami people live to like bring forces together and to, to make this place, you know, which, which to me is like not, not a na national place. So uh, w one, one reason why we, um, one important reason for me why we engage with, with different indigenous uh, um, artists or artists coming from indigenous uh, backgrounds was that they, um, their presence and their work um, is the best way to, um, 
let's say, question or, or to, to annihilate the idea of a nation state as a kind of sovereign, you know, deciding on what is going to be the, the kind of art produced here as opposed to art produced elsewhere and so forth, because, you know, this goes cross, cross borders. Um, so I guess this was uh, one of the reasons why we, we decided to engage. Uh, being funded by most, you know, cultural institutions that support artists from a particular country and so forth. So, something constitutes a problem here, you know, because, of course, it's nice uh, to to support Sami artists, and there is political reasons to do so in each of these countries. But it's also a, a very fragile moment. Um, mm. uh, who and on, uh, you know, which conditions <laughs> should should extend such support? So, so I guess, y you know. Uh -huh. I would just mention also that um, it was when you have at an exhibition like Documenta, when you have the woman leader of the Sami parliament sort of coming um, and attending and being very much part of um, this experience, um, you know, where is sort of also where, of course, um, the, the, the leaders of the German nation are also present. Um, there are these ways of, of creating a field we know one that is not even, but one where there is, we, we create also these points of tension and coexistence and make certain structures and regimes visible. Um, and I, 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 I honestly believe that uh, there has been a lot of impact and rethinking around indigenous practice um, after Documenta. And I would sort of, it's not, it, it, it also um, can be um, excruciatingly <laughs> consumptive. But it is really up to all of us um, to continue this sort of effort to also counter that sort of consumptive tendency um, in much smaller ways within our work so that it isn't purely about making sort of these practices hyper visible, but also how you sort of continue to restructure your work and processes after such an exhibition and platform. So mm -hmm. I think we are out of time um, fully. And uh, we're going to have uh, two more, um, one more presentation now, um, and then two more after lunch. So uh, thank you so much, Adam. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you um, Oval Dermasoglu, who is a curator and writer based in Berlin, Istanbul and Graz. After her guest professorship for curatorial theory and praxis in Nuremberg Fine Arts Academy, she currently is one of the curators of the Streichwasser Herbs Festival in Graz, which will take place this September. In Istanbul, Oval has acted as the director and curator of Yama Screen between 2015 and 16. She was curate, curatorial and public program advisor for Gulsun Kar Mustafa's retrospective in the uh, chron um, Chronographia at the Hamburger Bahnhof Museum for Gegenwart, and she's going to discuss um, these two projects with us today. She's also organized coordinated programs and events as a Goethe Institute Fellow at Maybe Education and Public Programs for Documenta 13 and has been the Artistic Director of Festival Sophia Contemporary 2013 Near Closer Together, Exercises for a Common Ground. This is also a project that Ovo will discuss with us today. So as you see, we're sort of moving through um, a range of formats um, that Ovo has been part of. Um, and one of the things that's been very unique about her approach is the way that she blends in uh, exhibition making and programming um, and really has been building communities um, across various cities and contexts. Um, so look Thank forward you. to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. I mean, this is uh, uh, such a pleasure uh, to be in front of such an invigorating, challenging audience and uh, part of also amazing practitioners uh, who also inspire me with their thoughts and acts. Uh, of course, this trouble will be a different trouble. So, I mean, I will take you to a different universe uh, of my universe. It's a universe of uh, 10,000 things. And um, it moves through continents and cities. How do I do this? What? Does it work? One. I am the other way around. OK. Well, yeah. well, yeah, that's a good starting point. Um, so I will open my talk with more like a kind of a positioning, and then afterwards I will connect uh, some projects that I did over the last, let's say, three, four years' time, <laughs> like to this positioning. And um, of course, for this position, I want to start from like the kind of, let's say, the basics, the fundamentals uh, for me. Um, the Sphinx was destroyed when Oedipus answered her riddle correctly as human. Uh, and right now I feel it is the time, maybe referring to the Shanghai Biennial, to inquire about the questions, since the answers we have cannot respond uh, the unified feeling of discontent around the world and its anti-intellectualism anti uh, that is offered as a solution to this discontent. What is the answer? Then what is the question? This is a famous quote by Gertrude Stein. And she asked this question to her partner, uh, Alice B. Toklas. Um, as a follow-up, in a different context, in the very elaborate season of migration to the north by Tayyip Salih, the Sudanese author, he is in the book more interested in the questions of colonialism rather than easy answers. The dualities he structured his novel, which I would certainly recommend for anyone, I think it's a kind of a very fundamental reading, challenges the dichotomy between self and the other. And for him, one is not so much different from the other. His two main characters travel between north and south, east and west, they speak Arabic and English. The four-headed sphinx that you see here is part of the very famous collection of Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna. And it is uh, dated uh, 2000, I think 2 AD. Yeah, it's in the second half of second century. It's made of marble. It belongs to the collection of antiquities. For me, this is such a symbolic image for my thinking, but also the way, the way we are struggling with, with our subjectivities today. Because the foreheads 
of the Sphinx already shattered the most well-known Cartesian mind and body connection and challenged the dichotomy machine of like, Western epistemology. It also reminds me of the saying by Maya Angelou in the beginning of talk, she always like thinks about all the women behind her and then she is like an army of women when she's speaking in front. So for me, like when I have the Sphinx, four-headed Sphinx behind me, I feel like I am also with an army of women. Um, let's see. So let's pass to another context. I mean, it's not so far. This is Anatolia. It is the Neolithic uh, times. It is a, uh, another famous like uh, um, idol figure of two goddesses embracing each other in the same body uh, from the central Anatolia, uh, Çatalhöyük. Um, and, um, and as you see here, like the two bodies, like they come together um, in one, uh, two minds or two subjectivities come together in one body in reciprocity, but they also embrace each other, they touch each other. So there is certainly a different boundary or maybe no boundary between mind and body here as represented. Another example, again, uh, from Anatolia. And this is, again, central Anatolian, like very antique. I think this is even before, is it the Paleolithic? Um, and again, like a kind of a goddess figure we see. At this time, they are part of the same base. And they are like these two bodies, like appearing out of the same base. So as you see, there are no borders, no individual spaces, no customized choices. Um, and my connection to today is, let's say, also to, to the art practice and thinking that I come from in Turkey, um, is Double Reality by Gülsün Kara Mustafa. Uh, this is a particular image from um, cross-generational exhibitions that happened in Istanbul in the early, late 2000s and, and early, sorry, in the er, late 90s and early 1000s. And uh, Gülsün uh, found this male mannequin on the street wearing a maternity dress. And uh, she decided to bring that, bring that whole body, whole ready-made into the space of the exhibition. And of course, as you can imagine, designing, let's say, uh, the um, conflicting squares around, that like conflicting space around. Let's stay here. So from, uh, from this position, I'd like to think a little bit about uh, our beloved Edouard Glissant. Because he rightfully points out that from the perspective of the Western thought, understanding people and ideas requires being measured with transparency. He says, in order to understand and thus accept you, I have to measure your solidity with ideal scale providing me with grounds to make comparisons and perhaps judgments. I have to reduce. But as we all know, when there is reduction, there is no relation. And today, when the codes of our lives perform control and transparency all the way through, we need to answer that transparency through thinking opaque. And of course, there are various readings of opacity. Certainly, it's not obscurity. It's something else. It can be understood as an incalculable alterity that is at once the relational ontology of the world, an ethical demand, certainly, a form of political legitimation, and a poetics. Um, to paraphrase Glissant again, he says, some truth manifestations come to us intuitively, like a sparkle of light in the dark. They mustn't be isolated from the darkness and opacity out of which they emerge. 
So therefore, against this environment of deranged reduction that we are all experiencing, we must not surrender to the partitioning of the world, nor to irre irre irreconcilable differences, to binary oppositions, to oppositions of species, and genres, and gender, and else, and else. So, when I speak to this part, I, would, I mean, I will still continue to position, but I want to accompany you uh, with uh, the very, I mean, very important initiation, I wouldn't say a project, but initiation of Istanbul-based artist Banu Cennetoglu, the list, because she is talking about that reduction and the information of that reduction. So, um, of course, when we are thinking of this reduction, the borderless stream, as we understand of the post-89, maybe we understood it more like in, with all these elections that happened in 2016, it seems to be a reductive one in the first place. So it wasn't really what it says it was. And with the resurgence of the right-wing populisms across the world, I know that here you are suffering from one, in my country I'm suffering from one. They are all the same faces. They are part of, like, they are these multi, multi-headed monsters. Uh, they are part of the same body. Um, the globalism right now has turned from friend to foe. Uh, however, I mean, whether these politicians would like to accept or not, there always have been many unexpected violent and non-violent affinities across the different strata of nature, the communities, and cultures resisting the one-sided ideological readings. And from our side, I think, uh, whether we like it or not, it is impossible to ignore the fact that the process of subsuming our political and social subjectivities under micro and macro control models have brought us to our current deranged predicament. And when we look at the embracing bodies of the Neolithic age, when we look at the four-headed sphinx of the Roman times, we see a different past and a different way of thinking. So for me, you know, in my work, uh, the future cannot look elsewhere without acknowledging and accepting what it was we did in the first place. What happened when we abandoned those habits and started building new ones? Because obviously, we live in a world of 10,000 things. And the linear thinking of reduced Western subjectivity cannot access and fathom and go beyond that. Um, so therefore, of course, here, the question is grasping the personal fundament that will immediately connect with a collective fundament. So that's why I use the word resilience, resilience curating as a form of resilience. Uh, because for me, there's honestly nothing else to do. Uh, and I use this word because I, I refuse like this straightforward divisions between art and activism, art and politics, political art, aesthetic art. Um, it is beyond that. It is, it is a model we need that needs to embrace all of these dichotomies, like killing and collapsing the dichotomy machine rather than surrendering to it. Um, in Merriam-Webster dictionary, if you go to back to basic again, uh, the word resilience is described as a derivation from the uh, Latin verb resilire, meaning to jump back, to recoil, and it is, the word itself is like based on salire, which means to leap. So it already, you know, carries this conflict inside itself um, that is a jump back and leap at the same time. But it's a, of course, resilience is a term that is regularly used um, in, in physics, 
It's the ability of the elastic material to absorb energy and respond, respond back. And also this phenomenon stands for um, a person's ability to bounce uh, after a setback. And for me, of course, clearly resilience is, uh, yeah, what? Just oh, images. Oh, yeah. Sleep. Yes, I, we have a lot of images. You're right. Uh, so, resilience is a major component of constructive hope. And today, experimenting with, in my work, with various models, um, with um, experimenting with institutions and like independence, independent work, expressing a world vision in various forms, as I'm also trying to do here right now, claiming for a political voice that doesn't repeat the status quo, or that doesn't yearn for moral provocation, for a rigorous poetics that attempts to relate to its context and its audience, yes, curating is a form of resilience. Here you see the, a project that I was engaged with, Yama Public Screen. It is the first public uh, screen of Istanbul. It doesn't function anymore, unfortunately. Uh, after the coup attempt of 2016, it's impossible to do anything actually public, in public space freely anymore. Um, and, um, and I was very honored to do some of the last projects that I actually commissioned for the screen. Um, this collaboration with Banu Neto Blue, the list is an actual list of people who lost their lives crossing the borders of the fortress Europe uh, since 1993. So uh, despite this crisis, as refugee crisis, with all of this, let's say, politically correct uh, uh, vocabulary that's used in the Western press, it started long before, actually, with the Yugoslavian war. Um, and uh, Bano has been working with this list for, actually, for quite a long time. She also did this project in various places, um, also in Basel. Um, and right now in Liverpool, um, and this was like an iteration back again in 2015. It was the time of the Istanbul Biennial, and actually it was the time of um, this famous sad image that also Ai Weiwei provoked of this kid uh, on the Aegean coastline. Uh, and this was a particular like video piece that no information was repeated one more time, uh, and it was all the, the known facts of people, where they come from, the region they cross, and why they died, reported, of course, with all the efforts of the uh, volunteering uh, humanitarian agency. Of course, through initiating, let's say, uh, through initiating this information uh, in the visibility of her artistic space, Banu questions the nature of the information, and how does it make us feel, and how can we actually relate with that, and what does it mean to uh, show this information, to make this information more and more visible in, uh, in the public space. <coughs> so the second, I mean, I have to say, like, while we had uh, Banu's work, there were already some people asking about what it was to the reception. I mean, as you see, like, this is a very central location in Istanbul, and this screen can be seen from anywhere else, like, close by. Um, and we suspected, of course, it was, like, a sort of uh, intelligence of police, like asking like what this is, was all about. And this second commission, the Workers Forum, with Pili Vitakala, uh, a Berlin and Helsinki-based artist, uh, was talking about like the prosthetic labor in our, in our world today. Uh, she worked as a part of an online dating app. And then afterwards, she created, like and she initiated a workers forum where these workers behind like this, um, this online um, boyfriend, girlfriend app, uh, the problems that they kind of came across. So it is, of course, a very valid critique of like the labor functions today uh, and how machines still need the human intelligence and emotionality uh, to continue their operation. And um, so the Workers Forum uh, actually was also the project where we had the conversation with Pilvi and the Istanbul, now Hong Kong-based curator, Özge Arsoy, that we experienced the presence of 
the first uh, police, secret police, like coming to watch uh, uh, the event and what it was about. So I never actually experienced this in Istanbul before. So this was something very particular for me. And unfortunately, with the third project that we initiated, the screen uh, started to receive um, invisible threats back from people calling the hotel. And the municipality said that they cannot let the screen anymore. So uh, I would say like these images are like the last images of the Yama public screen in Istanbul. Uh, the PC, the very site-specific PC that operated it is deconstructed by the municipal and hotel authorities not to cause any more uh, conflicts in the public space. The screen is projecting this video project, video, video project that's kind of commissioned. With Baunus, it was all this video of the information that lasted, let's say, uh, video that lasted like a, a one month and 10 days. And it was never repeating itself, and it was flowing. And with Pili's work, it was a projection of this kind of online chat conversation uh, between the workers talking about their problems as like the online laborers of part-time space. Um, and actually like the relationality, you know, how humans relate to each other with all this, of course, question of like the private relationship expanded to this kind of fake space. It yes, it was legible. It was legible. Of course, like it was very particular. Of course, the technologies that Pilmi speaks about, this was a very interesting contrast with this particular project because the technologies that Pilmi is speaking about is well beyond the technology when the screen was installed. It was first of its kind. Uh, it was even before the LED screens. So it's a very particular technology that doesn't really exist anymore. It came from Australia all the way, and it was installed on the top of a hotel with the initiation of the uh, family. One of the members of the family is a, very, uh, is a very good art patron, and he was very supporting this project from the very beginning. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Wow. <laughs> That's what happens when come after a long discussion. Um, okay, so then I hope maybe I would really like to speak about this project, which is a very dear project of me, for me. And um, this is an image from Janan, uh, uh, means you're finally inside of me. And this exhibition that happened in uh, 2015 and 16 is the 20th year anniversary of Chaos GL, which is the first uh, LGBTI um, NGO in Turkey that is still like very forcefully uh, continuing, as, uh, continuing its activities despite all the restrictions coming from various, you know, publics and like state. And the, the exhibition uh, that I titled as Future Queer, but of course there's a reason that I uh, titled as Future Queer. And um, I know that I have a short of time, but I still want to go through another important quote that I want to share with you in the space of this thought. Um, this is uh, from uh, another really very, I think, important reference for the queer thought uh, by Jose Munoz, is cruising, cruising Utopias. And he says, we have never been queer, yet queerness exists for us as an ideality, to be distilled from the past and used to imagine the f a future. The future is queerness domain. Queerness is a structuring and educated mode of desiring that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. So inspired from this thought, the, the uh, exhibition was titled Future Queer, a queerness that is yet to come, a queerness that's not really belonging directly to you know, a sexual orientation, but to a state of mind, to an aesthetics that can break the quagmire of the present. And, and of course, it was a big load for me. I mean, 20th year of, uh, of a movement is a painful movement, but it's also a very brave movement. And it was a very big responsibility to take this challenge, to try to go through uh, what to do. So uh, Chaos GL has a magazine that used to be a very important platform for people to communicate through uh, when there was no internet and you know, uh, no apps and chats. 
uh, and uh, they also published important artist portfolios, very young at the time, that supported Chaos GL magazine through their statements. And in this show, we decided to bring together like the artists who contributed to the magazine and selected works of them to, uh, to become part of uh, this space. Um, of course, this was very important, like this happened uh, in a house, in a villa space, and this was a very important statement for me because all the public movements always start from this kind of private, intimate gatherings, and then this kind of force comes out uh, to, you know, to outside, to public, uh, to join uh, the public discourse. And, and there was, as you can imagine, there's a huge archive of Chaos GL, which I really tried like, to erase boundaries with the exhibition. So there's in various moments in this publicness, in this tension between public and private, uh, which is uh, something very delicate in Turkey, uh, there were like these iterations of like the archival moments that the artists were responding. So it was a kind of moving back and forth, which was very important for me to state. Here is, an inter here is like, for example, an installation of uh, uh, Nibar Güreş, an Istanbul and Vienna-based artist like, who's really working a lot, maybe one of the first artists openly working with queer politics in a sense. But of course, it was also about like, creating the house space, like a breathing space, a breathing space reminding us like, what actually these movements achieved in Turkey. Uh, in the time of, let's say, the darkness, when everybody is feeling a little bit hopeless and uh, not knowing where to go. Um, and this was a kind of environment that I uh, tried to create, like, of course, through the generous support um, of the artists. So you really see a kind of a particular setting uh, in the house, um, also moving in between some like, works from the international context to support uh, support our statement. So for me, for example, this image of Berlin-based artist Susan Winterling is a very uh, important image for me that stands for like that, that opaque togetherness. Uh, that's very powerful. Again, um, maybe it's also important to say in the fact that, you know, the, the, this movement in Turkey, maybe all movements should it was never standing for like a sole cause of like the sexual orientation. It was always about anti-fascism, anti-militarism, uh, anti-homophobia, and anti-transphobia, like all together at the same time. So the position of the queer is a position of the togetherness in a political, radical po political togetherness in that sense that really tries to reach all of these channels. And uh, some uh, the magazine is quite big now, but you can really see like the early versions of it, which was kind of copy and Xerox space. And the school that we did inside like the exhibition space, and inviting with queer activists, because of course the activist space and the contemporary art space, they are two really different spaces, try to bring um, all these kind of, let's say, forces together and make them uh, make them discuss. So actually, the exhibition, I mean, this was the biggest opening I ever experienced in my life. It was such an embrace from the public. Um, and uh, we had an amazing uh, variety, a myriad of audience uh, coming from different backgrounds, really, like uh, visiting and discussing with us. Should I continue with Gülsün? What do you think? Like we because do we? Go okay. And then, we have to and then we have to stop. Okay. Um, so something that is kind of quite connected. I mean, in the exhibition of the uh, the future queer, for example, there were artists that were marked in the map, and there were artists who contributed as sort of like the environment of the past house. Um, that the, the kind of house environment that, and Gülsün Kara Mustafa was uh, one of them. Uh, and Gülsün is, uh, uh, is one of the, uh, I don't know if you know her work, uh, but she is one of the landmarks uh, of contemporary art in Turkey. She's been practicing various forms of art since the last uh, 45, 50 years. And, um, and for me, she's always like, she is the queer thinker. 
She never, of course, identifies as such, and she never says as such, but it is so inherent in the work. And uh, I was very, of course, uh, honored to be able to work with her closely for her major retrospective uh, in Berlin. It was the first time that she made such a big show in Europe. And this is like, um, actually, the, the kind of this image, this work that you can remember, like it's one of the first works that I showed in the beginning of my presentation. And this installation uh, shows a little bit of her like textile work, but again, how she uses the ready-made, like the, the popular, that it, that what is popular, but trying to really understand the kitsch as a, um, as a public force, as a critical voice uh, that can be embraced, which is always very present in her work. And of course, as you can also understand, there's always the mythology of women that she deals with. Um, and here I always find it very like, beautiful that all of the women are in equal, let's say, positions, like there is no higher and lower. So um, they, all these mythologies for her is like the equally accessible mythologies that should be deconstructed and reconstructed again. And um, this is a quite different uh, project. Um, it's an educational structure that she referred to. Actually, this is something very dear for me because my grandparents are educated in this structure called Village Institutes. It unfortunately closed in the first 10, ten years uh, of the New Republic. Um, and um, the pictures that you're seeing is that the archival photos of the Village Institute that wanted the village kids to be the educators of themselves. So these institutions uh, created this one-to-one -one really special pedagogical model that created an important generation of intellectuals that dealt with uh, folk culture and realism and the countryside. Uh, in Turkey, my grandparents also spent all their lives teaching school children in villages across West Anatolia. Um, and uh, Gülsün, uh, wanted to kind of work with the structure because the structure itself was uh, created by a famous anti-fascist architect Margaret Chutelihotsky, who actually is a kind of a less known story that escaped to Turkey in the time of you know the challenges and uh, she provided some models some drawings for different projects, I mean, they had to be of use to be able to stay in Turkey, and the village institute model was something that she provided. Uh, and it was never directly used, but again, like, it was there always, like, as a model of construction, and referring to this, let's say, unbinding of uh, dichotomies, what Turkish culture stands for in Germany, uh, she uh, created this model and called modernity unveiled, because it's very much about how modernity is performed in Turkey and its complex roots. Maybe I should stop here. I think it's time. I mean, I have more images, of course, as you can imagine, but we can always like discuss them through. And I think this is a kind of a right good point to uh, end with this ongoing project of Objects of Desire, which is considered, again, like an important project of, let's say, uh, the uh, post-89. Uh, a space in Europe because Turkey was, Istanbul was one of the important ports and there was a huge flux of people and huge modes of exchange. People were coming with their goods to sell and they were buying things. Turkey was the closest, let's say, uh, liberal capitalist port that people access things uh, from the Soviet Russia and other nations. Um, and uh, this was maybe the first moment that Istanbul was like so, so international after its Ottoman time. And Gülsün created these um, um, objects for sale that one can bid up until like 100 euros. Um, uh, and all these objects actually she collected from the shops that was founded for these consumers in Istanbul um, and that can be bought and that, can, that the money was always going back to these women, like supporting these women, because they were really laboring, sexual laboring, uh, but also cleaning labor, a lot of domestic labor that they went through. It's a kind of, an, it was a huge invisible economy in Istanbul and generally in Turkey uh, at that point. And, and of course the project doesn't really function anymore. You cannot really buy, but you can really see the objects that she always adds on top. 
And then here is like the kind of uh, documentations of the objects that have been sold in time in the life of the project. So it's a very alive, like still living installation and still referring to, to our times of like thinking migration and all the invisible economies that uh, come with it. So I have more to say, of course, as you can imagine, but I need to stop now when I'm expecting your questions to go further. Thank you for your patience. Um, perhaps I, I can start. Um, it would be great to also draw a link um, between an exhibition such as Future Queer, um, but also then this sort of way in which queerness and opacity are interlinked um, and sort of intrinsically connected across various kinds of um, exhibitions that you have done. Yeah. Um, I'm also wondering how that sort of at this it's a sen sensitive question of, of um, what this sort of pluralistic um, ways of being um, are cited uh, within public space even today, right? I mean, your project in Sofia, the festival in Sofia, um, how do you sort of continue working in Turkey after the closing down of the Yama screen? I mean, yeah. Maybe we could take up some examples of yeah. that in your work. Uh, of course. I'd just like to give as an image, like was, what was the follow-up? Thank you. I mean, this is, of course, uh, an important uh, question in, in my work, uh, because something, of course, that I would wanted to refer to in my positioning uh, was about like the, the immune systems, the immune systems that we need to build today for ourselves. And uh, I mean, for me, honestly, this the position of the, the opacity and how it, how it embraces um, certain personal positions without falling into the like, trap, like in the way identity politics is used by the right-wing populisms today in various ways. Uh, for me, opacity is a very constructive, let's say, stone for that, for that systems of immunity. Um, and of course, I always, tend to go back into like a kind of more fundamental like histories rather than like looking at the histories of progress because progress and progress and progress but there's a certain point where we lose our level of contamination and I think this liberal thought uh, that we are all engaged with you know and we all contributed to in one way or the other in our work really like this political correctness killed our like immune systems in a very particular way. And thinking, I mean, this is also like our performance of transparency in our everyday, you know, through different means. Um, again, also through our projects, as I mean, I'm talking as a curator right now, as ours. So, um, uh, so for me, like uh, the future, uh, future queer was building an immunity system, reminding the community that what happened and what can happen more and what is actually, what certain things that may be lost, but that is really not lost, and that is very much there. And uh, to be able to like position that very the clearly, I really wanted the queer to be a mode of opaque alliance. Uh, like an alliance of, alliance of thoughts like that, like stand together. I sometimes think that of course this is a quite, let's say conflicting, idea that I'm still working with in my mind, like what if we create another model of, of queer theory, feminism and Marxism together, you know, with like balancing each other in certain politics, what would, how would it happen? What would it, how would it would help us? Um, so it is much more kind of related with that. And of course, I think Jose Munoz, when he wrote like the, the queer, uh, as a future potential, he was very uh, clear about like that uh, that opaque potential um, as well. And I think when we are speaking about uh, these artistic positions, uh, it is not only about like a gathering of the queer artists, but it is a kind of an, a queer alliance, a queer political thought, 
a queer aesthetical model, a potential that can bring us like think and breathe together. That's what we need. We don't need really any more, you know, like these groupings and also killing the potentials of artists. So because as we have been rightfully speaking through, um, uh, through this first day, an artist has multiple lives. It is a little bit like the Sphinx also. Uh, so you cannot, it's not only queer, it's not only Turkish, it's not only, uh, it's not only uh, Sunni, it's not, it's not only this and it's not only that. There are like so many various uh, bases that we should refer to when we are working together and in a very sensible way. I hope that answers. We're open for questions. Thank you, Ovo. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. I, I just thought that sort of to just scratch the surface of, or scratch the surface of opaque and transparent surfaces. Because I feel like, um, I mean, I. Can you hold the mic a little oh, closer? Yeah. Yeah, thank I you. feel like, I mean, I, I often hear discussions around opacity and the necessity for it in a time uh, when there's increased transparency due to information and uh, an expectation of transparency access and those kind of things. But when looking at the way things are working around us, like I'll, I'll just bring two anecdotes. One, um, you have, um, you know, like F-15 helmet visors, the helmet glass, when you're, when you're, when you're a pilot of those F-15 fighter jets, yep. you have a lot of information overlay happening simultaneously. Yep. And a lot of people had to be trained to see through that. Mm -hmm. And so there was an opacity of the screen that had to be made transparent. You know, so because it was, a, it was completely opaque. Or you take the stock exchange. You're there, you're looking at this massive like churning of information mm -hmm. and all of this information really means something to some people. Yep. They can decode it entirety. Mm -hmm. And some, it'll just look like abstract numbers. Which also then makes us probably rethink our relationship with representation and abstraction sure. as we live it right now. Mm -hmm and therefore also opacity and transparency because like maybe maybe we might need to find something else or some other way to describe what we're what we're discussing here and i'll just give an example of a friend this is, this is more a comment than a question uh, a friend who's based in dubai this uh, um, artist who is of chinese origin mm -hmm. uh, his name is lan tian zi and he a couple of years ago, he made this project where he got the Sheikh, the Sultan of Dubai's portraits made. And there's this official portrait of Sultan, uh, Sheikh, Sultan Sheikh Maktoum, if I'm not wrong. And there's an official portrait. And he got this made in Dafan village, which is one of the like, largest centers for reproduction of paintings um, of all, like, you know, all the great masters. Yeah. If you want a good reproduction of a Van Gogh or Vermeer, anyone, you go there. Yeah, there was an installation actually of an artist, Chinese artist in Documenta. Like he kind of collected all this reproduced. I see. So this one, he, Lee got, Lantian got the Sheikh's portraits made in exactly that state. Uh, portrait scale and had an entire exhibition of 15 of those portraits. Okay. Um, as he's showing these paintings, um, everyone's sort of wondering, is this in praise of the Sultan or is this um, sort of doing something else? The state, of course, did issue a notice and a mandate that none of these paintings can be sold. <laughs> so there's something produced, something can, that cannot be further transacted, but there's obviously a huge transaction of semantic or meaning and I think it might be interesting for us to, I mean, this is just to think along with you, to think um, maybe slightly on an edge, on, on the peripheries of the, the op on, on the edges of transparency and opacity, where really the contours of these lie. Um, another like small example, and end with that, which is like when you have uh, stealth fighter jets, they're basically trying to stay off the radar. Um, they're large opaque machineries flying up there which are trying not to be captured and are not captured on another representational device which is actually completely abstracted because it's just a green line moving on a circular screen marking a dot. So there might be something we might need to think about 
on this? I mean, for me, okay, like, let me think about this, because you're talking about s different examples, and I don't think they are really on the same line, for me at least, in my sure. thinking. There was this, uh, you know, there is, uh, Delhi has a lot of this uh, non-formal settlements, so the uh, municipality does surveys. So there, uh, and the surveys are basically uh, kind of tied to an idea of entitlement. The entitlement yeah. could be uh, f uh, sub fair price, uh, food access to probably a future land in the city, uh, ex periphery of the city. So in the survey, there is always this uh, this uh, essay written by th three friends. They argue that there is two words that people use in the neighborhood, which is called uh, pardarshi which would be translated as uh, transparent and pere, uh, pere, uh, what is it, pardarshi and uh, that it would be kind of a negotiated illegibility. Yep. So what is the, the idea of the negotiated illegibility is that we stay in thresholds and gradations of illegibility. Hmm. So, so say the person in the household may produce another family adjoined to it saying that we stayed together, but but they could create a wall saying that we are split to access two different cards, which may give them different entitlement. So this idea of the there is no th the, so eligibility is a kind of a threshold. So so there is a series of negotiated eligibility by which we produce our encounter. Yeah. So and in the in this forensic logic, they have this thresholds of detectability. You know, and they use it as a forensic, as a more a juridical form. But I think the negotiated illegibility that we are all el eligible to each other with various degrees of uh, thresholds, and those thresholds are continuously breached and reproduced. So that could be a more interesting uh, possibility to get out of the binary trap because the binary trap has a possibility of getting uh, looping inside. You know, like like you will be told that you are opaque. That's why you are illegitimate. Well, I mean, so um, I think, first of all, I mean, thank you for both of the points. But uh, I honestly don't think that opaque is like, as I kind of refer to Glissant's thought, uh, he is not really referring to opaque as like transparent opposition. Transparent opposition for him is obscure. So he talks about like obscurity. Now, not opacity. So opacity is already like a new proposal that comes out of like the dichotomy machine for him. And that opacity is also very much against like some of like the, the let's say, colonial, post-colonial uh, thinking of the time that I was also referring like by Tayyip Saleh, like really like linking in the space, like staying in the space of the self and the other and like dividing these boundaries like kind of very sharply. Um, so that opacity for me is like what it is kind of goes beyond like to embrace. And, and of course, um, uh, talking, about, talking about like transparency and control, uh, I'd like to remind that I didn't say that these are like acts of full transparency and control. I said the performance of transparency and control. This is very important because all of these codes, they don't actually do what they are supposed to do. I mean, as the Pilvis project shows, that, supplement, that still needs a human supplement. The EI still needs a human supplement to be able to relate, to be able to like continue and function. Uh, and that, that human counterpart, that human prosthesis already like kind of brings that kind of, you know, that space, that kind of in between, that's kind of an already like a shaded uh, space. And, um, and of course, for me, it is very like clear what you say. I mean, I'd like to first refer that and then refer that uh, comments. And thank you very much for both of them. Um, I mean, Harun Faruqi has this really important project when he's talking, I mean, there's this I think tan screen installation where he is talking about like the US Marines uh, um, fighting over in front of their 
in front of their computers, like they are accessing uh, like a simulation of uh, a simulation of Baghdad, and they are hitting those let's say parts of Baghdad, they are simulated, they are sometimes, or most of the times, they are like shooting civilian spaces, and most of the time, like that war is like kind of, uh, so really like unclear. Uh, and I see this already like in the war machine, and of course, of uh, this, our relation of the image is very much driven by that war machine, and that space that we put you know, we cannot relate that there is the space that we put between those places, between those people and those communities, and then there's this kind of, you know, virtual landscape that performs something, but we don't know actually what it does. And this unclarity, is, I think, is very well elaborated uh, in this work uh, by Faruqi. I don't remember the title. Natasha, do you remember the title of this? It was also in Hamburger yeah, Bahnhof. War games, yeah. Um, that is so. That is about that, and it's uh, uh, and uh, secondly, I also do do think that we need to claim our politics back. I mean, we always need to reclaim and reclaim and reclaim of the politics back. And um, in terms of illegibility, I mean, yes, I, I, I mean, I. To a certain degree, I uh, agree with you about the eligibility, but still, for me, the eligibility doesn't stand for the poetics. And this is a poetics that I still insist on, on working with. And, uh, uh, and, and there is, of course, one can argue that there is a certain eligibility involved in the, in the poetics, but it's more than a kind of another, another mode of communication and relating. So, I still do think that <coughs> that we kind of keep falling back into that space when when we are not really claiming that poetic space. The Hindi word was parde dari. So I forgot. Oh. There's a question up here. Can I get the water? I completely dried. Here. Um. Hi. Where, where, where? Ha. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, I think there was something in the end that you were sharing about how queerne queerness needs to exist with Marxism. But I think it's also a very geographical sort of a thing because queerness, I mean, it has gone beyond this, its understanding of it just within the sexu sexuality framework. And queerness already embodies the idea of a resistance within it because queerness That's is also also anti um, hegemony, and so Marxism or a lot of resistance. So I just think that they both. I mean, Marxism can be queered, but queerness already embodies resistance. So I don't. I just want to. Understand. Okay, I mean, this is already, I mean, as I would say that I was very clear about like this mode of resistance, queer as a mode of resistance, and that's already like as a kind of point of alliance, as this kind of political, political language, that political imagination that can be exercised uh, through different means. And then um, for, uh, uh, for me, when I kind of come up with that kind of like, that they say more provocative, let's say proposal. It's a question that is behind my mind. I think, uh, uh, I mean, yes, I agree that like queer is already like that kind of it passed like a certain like place. But there are certain potentials like in these kind of grand narratives that can, I wouldn't say like amalgam, but like that can be like reconstructed, like a skeleton to be reconstructed in a way that would. Uh, serve our thinking, but it may be called completely a different thing. And I think certain terms, of course, like they kind of uh, are like so branded in our mind about what they are and what they earned. Uh, and uh, uh, we also, I believe, like with the proposal of like let's say the opaque, that also for me aims to kind of 
push or like kind of cross across that. And I wouldn't agree that this is a kind of a geography. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Turkish. You know, I come from the middle. I come from the middle of everything, you know. <laughs> I know that I look white right now, but <laughs> I come from the middle of everything. I'm, it's like it's all these kind of crossovers and cut all these kind of struggles and uh, um, all these kind of struggles of modernity that is very, like, very particular, you know. It's like very, it's a kind of big crisis of modernity that right now pays back, you know, in the form of Erdogan, so. <laughs> We're, um, we're out of time, unfortunately, but we're actually going to take up a lot of uh, more sort of dense discussion time tomorrow, um, which is also a way of luring you to return. Um, but for now, we need to have a lunch break, um, and then we have um, two more presentations. So, thank you. Thank you. Going back. Uh, we break for lunch. Lunch is not served at the hub. No. Uh, the presenters stay back. But please do come back five minutes before time so we can start on time. We're running a little bit behind schedule. So see you in an hour or 55 minutes.